How's everyone doing today? Pretty good. My name's Amin. I'm a medical student at the University of Tennessee, and right now I'm taking a research year in the Department of Radiation Oncology at MD Anderson. I'd uh, like to take this time to thank Dr. Clifton Fuller, who's my research mentor, as well as the uh, lab group who support and, without whose support and guidance this work wouldn't have been possible. And I'd like to thank Rice for offering me this opportunity. This is a really rare opportunity for a medical student, so thanks for taking the time to be here today. So my talk today is on radiomics, a tool for predicting tumor response in head and neck cancer patients. And I hope it reflects some of the work that the uh, lab does, which is the use of anatomical and functional multi-imaging modalities to better plan radiotherapies for patients. OK, so right now I'd like to um, go through my conflicts of interest slide. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about radiomics workflow and then about head and neck cancer and then pre previous radiomics research before delving into the uh, study in more detail. So one of the goals of medicine is to design treatments tailored to each patient, right? <clears throat> this is a particular obstacle in cancer because of the number of variables that can go into a patient's treatment outcome. Demographic characteristics, tumor characteristics, treatment characteristics. If there is a way that we could cat uh, characterize tumors better, Maybe we can mitigate some of this variance. And one of the ways that we can do this is through the use of radiomics. Radiomics is a burgeoning application in clinical oncology. It uses the uh, quantitative evaluation of anatomical structures combined with clinical characteristics to uh, design better treatment planning. Uh, in the past, research has focused on traditional principal component analysis, uh, which cannot adequately project trends in treatment. Um, our study extracts radiomic features at multiple time points during treatment for a functional analysis. And so this is just a description of radiomics workflow. The first step you do is you image the patients. The second step is selecting your region of interest. We're interested in the tumors. Our region, in, our region of interest is going to be the tumors. If you're interested in organs at risk during uh, radiation treatment, uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Lin, did a study on the parotid gland. His poster is outside if you're interested in reading that. And then how you select these regions of interest is you contour them in radiation oncology, that is. And that is you draw to include the uh, gross tumor volume. And this was done in our study by radiation oncology trainees and then verified by experts. You can also use auto-contouring machine learning algorithms. OK. So after we've contoured these tumors, you can extract radiomic features with statistical softwares. We use an in-house software called IBEX to get these features. And from there, you can integrate the data, you can mine it, and you can build models. OK, so what are some of these radiomics feature categories? This is just a small list of them, but you can have size and shape-based parameters. But what's more interesting are textural parameters. So 3D images are composed of these little volume blocks called voxels, right, with specific intensity levels and spatial orientations. You can then create maps based on these characteristics to give an overall characteristic of the tumor itself. And just a little bit about our subside of study, the head and neck. The head and neck includes, but is not limited to, um, the oral and nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the major and minor salivary glands, uh, and the thyroid. Um, the thyroid has a completely different path of physiology than the tumors that I'm going to be talking about, which typically arise from the respiratory epithelium. Oral cavity and pharyngeal cancer patients. Uh, the annual incidence in males um, is about 4% of all new cancers as of 2017, and that's from ACS statistics. 50% uh, of cancers uh, arise over the age of 50, 50% uh, actually over the age of 60. Uh, male to female incidence ratio is 3 to 1. Uh, African American patients uh, demonstrate the highest incidence as well as the highest case mortality. Um, in black male patients, 4.77 people per 100,000 die from the disease per year, and um, versus 3.66 in white males. Okay, so this data just shows the rising incidence in um, Caucasian patients with oral cavity and pharyngeal cancers, um, typically believed to be attributed to co-infection with human papillomavirus which encodes specific oncoproteins that lead to cell cycle dysregulation. And this shows the need to collect, sorry. Whoops. Anyway, that slide showed the need to collect HPV data 
in patients because it's all over the head and neck cancer subsides. Um, especially in orifere and geal cancer patients, which compose the majority of our cohort, which is about 61.5% of the patients in our study. As far as the anatomy goes, uh, the oropharynx includes the uh, palatine tonsils, the posterior tonsillar pillars, the GP sulcus, the posterior pharyngeal wall, some of the stuff you guys may know about, probably not. Um, the nasopharynx is, is located directly above the oropharynx. It it's uh, bordered anteriorly by the nasal cavity, uh, posteriorly by the uh, prevertebral musculature and the anterior margins of C1 and C2. Uh, superiorly by the clivus is a groove in the skull base and inferiorly by the oropharynx. And uh, 20, around 26% of the patients in our study had nasopharyngeal cancer and the rest had sinonasal, which is just cancer arising from the epithelium of the nose and sinus cavities. So how has radiomics been used in um, head and neck cancer studies? So uh, two medical students in Dr. Fuller's lab uh, did a systematic review of that very application. And uh, this table was pulled from their paper, and it shows radiomics just as they're used in prognostic and predictive biomarkers. And I won't talk about each study in detail, but Ertz, Ertz et al., okay, they extracted 440 radiomic features from uh, pretreatment, pretreatment, that's important, CT scans of 1,019 patients. And these features included intensity, shape, uh, texture, um, and then they built a statistical signature based off those features and ran them on validation data sets of head and neck cancer patients and lung cancer patients and found them associated with oncologic outcomes. The problem is they only used one time point and they also looked at surrogate endpoints, not the actual intact tumor biology of treatment response, but uh, survival uh, surrogates that they came up with. So how did we... Um, how do we mitigate these uh, challenges and radiomics problems? Well, one thing that we did is we got our things stuck here. So anyway, so one of the ways that we did this is we looked at a functional approach. We took 39 locally advanced head and neck cancer patients all undergoing image-guided radiotherapy. We uh, scored their treatment response using the response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. Uh, all patients either showed a complete response, which is the disappearance of all target lesions, or a partial response, at least 30% uh, uh, decrease in target lesions. No patients had stable disease or persistent disease or progressive disease during uh, treatment in our cohort. Okay, so after we've coded their treatment response, uh, how did we get their data? So we extracted 155 CT scans at days 1, 5, 10, and 15 of their treatment. Okay. And then uh, we contoured the region of interest, the tumors, uh, radiation oncology trainees, and then two radiation oncology experts verified their contours. After that, we used our in-house statistical software, IBEX, to extract radiomic features in the following categories, intensity direct, shape, gray level co-occurrence matrix, and gray level run rent, and shape. Um, and from there, we built a statistical signature on seven categories and associated them with treatment response. So these were the seven categories that we included in our model. And not to go over every feature, but just to describe some of them. Gray level co-occurrence matrix, that describes the number of times two particular intensities appear between two pixels at a given distance in a given direction. Um, from there, you can construct, con construct apparent matrices in 3D direction, or you can get each feature from each slice of the CT scan and average them to come up with a 2.5 value. A gradient orient histogram is a, dis a description of the distribution of grayscale in an image, and skewness means the direction of illumination. Okay, so then we built three models. Okay, we had a traditional PCA approach where we just used the baseline feature to correlate that with uh, treatment response. We had the ratio from <coughs> mid treatment to baseline and correlated that with treatment response. And then we had the functional approach, where we actually use all four time points in our analysis to correlate with that with treatment response. So what did that look like at the end? So to describe the cohort in more detail, we had 36 uh, male head and neck cancer patients, mainly and three female. Uh, most were either former or never smokers, and most had unknown HPV status. Uh, and the age was typically 54 years. 
And again, most of the patients in our study, 61.5% uh, oropharynx, the rest either nasopharyngeal or sinonasal. Most cancer, was, uh, most cancer patients in our cohort were uh, diagnosed at a late stage uh, with nodal involvement, and most came from a squamous histology. All patients in our study received radiation, of course, and then all but one patient received chemotherapy. And so here's the area under the curve of our, um, our three models. The baseline model uh, performed worse than chance. Uh, the mid-treatment to baseline ratio um, just performed slightly better. And then our functional approach was better than all three. And then we decided to include this with clinical characteristics to see how they would do. So the clinical case characteristics with known prognostic value was also a bad model. This could be due to the fact that most of our cohort was HPV unknown. Um, the functional PCA approach was still, you know, the area under curve was still 0.706. The baseline model was still trash. The mid-treatment to baseline ratio still performed better than chance. I do not have the 95% confidence intervals available, and I'm still waiting for that from the statistician. This was, again, a supplementary analysis. So what are the limitations of our study? Uh, one, we only had 39 patients. This was a pilot study. We recognize that. MD Anderson sees about 50,000 head and neck cancer patients a year. Not all of them incident, but you can tell we, the need to pers uh, prospectively collect this data. Another thing is that our cohort came from a diverse set of subsites. If you have a diverse set of subsites and you're looking at diverse tumor characteristics, of course a model designed to look at diverse tumor characteristics would have you know, a relationship with treatment response. So the idea is to use this model on a patient subset with a known tumor biology, such as HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer patients with a known survival advantage. They tend to live longer than those with HPV negative tumors. And um, we did use an in-house statistical software, IBEX. Uh, we recognize that radiomics feature sampling and filtering may differ depending on what statistical software that you use. Um, the good thing is that there's an international standardization of biomarkers, uh, IBSI, and we plan to follow those in the rest of our studies. So again, thank you to MD Anderson, thank you Rice, and thank you to my school for allowing me this research here. Thank you all for coming today. Appreciate it. So uh, questions for our speaker. Hi, Harvey. How did you choose your imaging markers? How did we choose our imaging markers? Yeah, why just those seven? Okay, so we ran a Spearman's correlation coefficient of 0.7 to reduce the number of features because to avoid overfitting, okay? Another reason is because there are a lot of volume dependent features. All right, that would have a, you know, would have a correlation with treatment response, but not for the reasons that we're interested in. Another question? I have a question. Yeah. Um, is this something that you would be uh, able to put your data online and publish a notebook or something like that? It's not specific to you, just as a data point in the broader medical science community. Is that something you're willing to do? And what are your thoughts on doing that kind of thing? Actually, that's a great question, because that's one of the things my mentor talked about in our research meeting a couple weeks ago. Uh, the, plat the statistical software that we use is open source. Um, and it was designed to, you know, share between institutions. If we had a standardization of the anonymization procedures for the images between institutions, that we'd be more comfortable sharing the data. But one of our long-term goals is to be able to, you know, share our applications. Yeah. So what are your what are your next steps? Obviously, you've done this this preliminary study. Right. What, what's the what's the next step in terms of what you're going to be doing for your research? So, um, I, I, sorry, I think I addressed this a little bit in the conclusions, but I probably should have clarified myself. We do want to run this data prospectively on a patient on patient subset with a known tumor biology, like HPV positive or pharyngeal cancer patients. Um, we also want to try running radiomics applications on MRI. So, other people have done this before but not using a functional PCA approach and not using specific uh, MRI images and sequences that we plan to use. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, with that, uh, let, me, let us thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you so much.